Welcome to today's post-Cabinet press conference. I have the Minister of Labor and Small Enterprise Development with me here today. She is going to make one short an announcement, after which we'll be willing to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, colleague, members of the media, good afternoon. Yesterday, the Ministry of Labor hosted a workshop on contract labor, reducing the dependency. At that workshop, at a panel discussion, the General Secretary of the National Trade Union Center made a statement to with that the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago has no, has the legal ability to pay the workers of ArcelorMittal severance and retrenchment benefits. As a consequence of that statement, I sought legal advice on whether or not there was any accuracy in the statement made. The advice that I received inform me that uh, the decision of the Privy Council in Singh established that severance and retrenchment benefits are not payable in the course of liquidation as in the case of ArcelorMittal. I am also informed that ArcelorMittal has to date paid uh, all monies ordered by the industrial court, and that is arising out of the last judgment against ArcelorMittal. They would have made all payments, plus they would have paid the fine charged by the court, and those payments would have been made sometime at the end of March, at the end of March of this year. In addition to that, ladies and gentlemen, arising out of a meeting that I held as a Minister of Labor with both the President and other executive officers of the Steelworkers Union of Trinidad and Tobago and Ursula Mittal, that would have been the Monday before the liquidation, one of the undertaking was to inform both the union and myself as Minister of Labor and Small Enterprise Development of the name of the liquidator, a telephone contact of the liquidator, in addition to informing on the process that would be used by the UTC in refunding the workers under the savings plan. Plan And I received a memo from the CEO on the 7th of April informing of the appointment of Mr. Chris Kelschel as the liquidator and also informing that they had contacted the unit trust Coover branch and spoken to a particular official who advised them that she would send all information regarding the income tax calculations of the workers and that they would process the checks for all members of the savings plan, but they would do so, they would need at least a week. So that based on the information I would have received, it meant therefore that the former employees of ArcelorMittal ought to be receiving monies from the savings plan either by the end of this week or early next week, um, as well as some other statements that, um, that he had made other information concerning a particular employee who were not paid any, any termination payment and payment consistent with the award of the court. And that's the simple clarification I wish to make, given the statement that was made by the General Secretary of NATOC at yesterday's workshop. 
Thank you, Minister, and we are now available to take any questions that you may have on a statement or otherwise. The discussion that was held the day before the liquidation focused around how the trustee, the, the trustees of the pension plan, how are they going to manage the entire process as well as the actuary? What we were informed on, because it's a very large capital that is involved, it is unlikely that one insurance company can carry that load. And therefore, they may have to look at a consortium of insurance companies to address the issue of the pension plan. Now that we have a timeline for the disbursement of um, severance uh, benefits and plus, um, I don't understand. You, you indicated that uh, the former employees of ArcelorMittal would be receiving their benefits by severance and other benefits by this week. I said that? Or next week, early next week. Uh, please, let me repeat. Yes. I never said anything like that. I am sorry then for describing that to you. Please, okay, let, let, me, let me repeat what I said. The reference to payment has to do with the savings plan. Yes. The savings plan that was up or is operated because it's still alive. I don't think the, the workers would have received the payments. That the Unit Trust Corporation, which manages the savings plan, this is information coming from Mr. Robert Belize to myself via an email informing that such payments to the workers would take place either by the end of this week or early next week. That is a refund of their savings under the savings plan. What I clarified was the statement made by Mr. Michael Anizet yesterday at a workshop hosted by the ministry to wit that the Companies Act makes provision for the government to pay the workers of ArcelorMittal retrenchment and severance benefits. And it is based on that statement that I immediately sought legal advice. And legal advice indicate that uh, the Privy Council Judgment Singh ruled that uh, once a company files for liquidation, retrenchment and severance benefits have been removed. I was just trying to establish as well what timeline for possibly for this consortium of um, insurance companies and so on to be, you know, uh, organized. So that I, I, cannot, I cannot say what, what we were informed is that it may take a couple months. Okay. And that's the information given by the actuary from Bacon, Woodruff and D'Souza. Hi, Minister uh, Keijan Haynes, TV6. Just for some clarification, under which law was Mr. Anisat saying that the government has the ability to uh, to pay workers who have been uh, retrenched? Under the Companies Act. And given the state of the economy, let's assume that it, the company was not in liquidation. Would the government be? Would the government have taken up this offer to pay that uh, those monies? Especially seeing that several other companies may close now, and they may also be looking to the government. Is this the uh, precedent that we might start seeing being set now? Well, if it was a question of retrenchment and severance benefits, this situation would not arise at all. And, uh, uh, just this is for either one. The police, fire, and uh, prisons officers came together yesterday, and they were upset over the payment of half 
in cash of the back paying cash and the other half in bonds. And they also it seemed like they were threatening a little level of unrest and, and protest action, even though they technically can't. Uh, is there anything that the government or the, that cabinet came spoke about today which would be able to alleviate their, alleviate their fears uh, going forward? Well, I think the, the Minister of Finance there is an undertaking to meet with those three unions and when the Minister of Finance returns, he will certainly address that issue. But I just want to make the point that uh, payment in bonds is not something new within the public service context. So why do you think there is this uproar over being paid in bonds? Well, I can't say. I I'm not even aware of that report. I got home last night. I had no time to view television, and I haven't even had time to read the newspapers today. So I am going based on what the information you are sharing with me now. Just to follow up to the last question, Mr. Minister, could it not be because of a lack of consultation? It's one of the things that they've complained about heading into the media budget review, that unions are not consulted about some of the measures uh, that would have been outlined in that budget. And I did say in the Senate on Tuesday night, I did indicate that there wasn't the breadth of time to engage in the kind of consultation that is required where you sit, you discuss, and the unions go back and they discuss and consult with their own membership and then come back to the table. Time did not permit that. And uh, we, really, we are really sorry about such a situation developing, but I'm quite sure once the Minister of Finance comes back and that meeting is held with the three unions in uh, national security, I am quite sure there would be a meeting of the minds because bonds, it has been in the past an acceptable form of payment within the public service. Hi. Hi. Actually, we have already set a date to begin that dialogue, and it is the 18th of May, where, of course, we will be collaborating with the Law Association on this issue, the Attorney General. I, I have discussed it with the Attorney General, who has kindly agreed uh, to be part of that dialogue, as well as Labour and employers, that means the three labor bodies, um, the Joint Trade Union Movement, the National Trade Union Center, the Federation of Independent Trade Unions and NGOs, as well as the private sector. You have the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce, you have Amchan, you have Trinidad and Tobago uh, Manufacturers Association, you have the, the Energy Chamber. We will be bringing all the stakeholders together to begin that dialogue um, addressing the Retrenchment and Severance Benefits Act, the Companies Act, and the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. Well, I could tell you what I would hope to see happen, which may not necessarily mesh with what emerges on the 18th of May. And, and that is why we have to take that kind of guidance from the Law Association, whose input is invaluable in this process. Well, let me say this. As I said yesterday at the workshop, there must be consultation because the consultations in the past, many of the 
stakeholders were not part of those consultations and therefore we cannot rule out consultation. But certainly we can attempt to put it on fast forward. However, there are constraints because the stakeholders involved, they have their own constituents to go back and consult and get direction in terms of the formulation of their own position on the issue. And I, I don't know how much faster the government can operate because a date has been set for May month um, to begin that dialogue which, to my mind, uh, conveys a sense of urgency that the government is acting. One has to remember that the government cannot act recklessly uh, under circumstances. The government has to weigh all the consequences, the various views and positions, and act in the best interest of the country, not in the best interest of any one sectoral view. Because the law association is an important stakeholder, and uh, every every process we are involved in, we have given the law association that we will partner with them. And uh, how do you reconcile this position um, with the position that was just um, discussed in relation to the bonds for um, members of the police, fire, and prison officers, where they were consulted? Well, I, I don't know that I can add to what I said earlier. When the Minister of Finance comes back, he will address that issue with the three unions involved. And I'm quite sure at the end of that discourse, there will be a meeting of the minds. The main issue behind the Privy Council ruling um, that you mentioned was the definition of retrenchment. And um, they adopted a very narrow definition saying that it related only to redundancy. Could the government consider simply bringing a simple amendment to change the definition of retrenchment pending these ongoing consultations? I, well, think, I think Mr. Bagu, you're offering free legal advice to the minister. But I, I think she'd be better um, to s go with her legal advice in dealing with this situation. Any other questions? But I just wanted to share with Mr. Bagu, I mean, the government could do almost anything, but the government will not because it is not the government alone that is engaged in this process. There are other players whom we must respect and must take their views on board. You mentioned a couple of times that when the Minister of Finance comes back, where is he heading off to? Is he going anywhere? Well, he has gone on government's business. Any further details? Well, I, I think... Um, <laughs> It's, it's, um, his travel was approved to attend the meetings of the IMF, which takes place every year, and he's part of the delegation attending it. In Washington. Yeah. He, should, he would be back by, by early next week. The Honorable Prime Minister. And just a follow-up question to you, um, Minister. The unions raised this morning the question of a retroactive le um, legislation that would facilitate retroactive payments. Is that something that would uh, be considered? We would have to be guided on what is legally possible or not. I will not want to um, presume any position, but would await that legal guidance. And this is for Minister Tuffy or either one. Did the issue of the ex carrying workers come up, even though Dr. Rowley, the Prime Minister, said that the $52 million from the EU is here? Yesterday, there are two DJ around the said there's an extra 25 million that's that's owed to them. Uh, the doctor always says no money more. Uh, was that raised at all in the cabinet? Well, I think Dr. Ali um, has given the government's position on that matter that the 50, 52 million will be paid, and after that, we will not be um, entertaining any other payment. And how will it be? Is it how is it going to be dispersed? Has that been decided as yet? How, how is it going to be divided or etc.? No. Has that been? Those d details we have not, we did not discuss. All right, but they're also threatening to take the government to court to get this extra money. Is the government prepared to deal with that? Yes, we'll cross that bridge when we meet it. Question. 
Um, what is the government's thinking in terms of you know ArcelorMittal or the steel industry as a whole going forward? The government is not in the steel business. ArcelorMittal was, and we all know what transpired. Uh, they have shut down their operations here, but they are operating elsewhere, where I guess the grass is greener for them. In the context of um, the nuisance situation in Tobago, uh, it is, um, uh, in fact, that there have been indications from the Public Services Association uh, that you know, the nurses uh, need to have their monies outstanding to them. I'm sorry, I, I am unaware of what is being referred to. In terms of um, back pay due to the nurses in Tobago, in particular, in this instance, we have heard that um, you know uh, on the on the on the in fact um, indicated by Mr. Duke, um, is government um, ready or moving to have this sorted out? Well, the government has given an on this. I, first to begin, I am unaware of what exactly that took place. I did indicate that um, I got home late last night, so I missed all the news. Um, but the government has given an undertaking to settle the debt. In 2016, the Minister of Finance during the mid-year uh, review indicated that 50% will be paid in cash and the balance to public officers would be paid by way of bonds. So that I don't know um, what is the counter response to that. But the debt is a debt the government has recognized and would meet. Uh, Mr. Coffey, this is for you. I understand that the board of GISL and CNMG met today with the Terence Farrell Committee. Uh, can you say what that meeting was about and do you know what came out of it? Well, I certainly don't know what came out of it because I was in cabinet, but I think I've said on several occasions here that the um, future of both companies have been referred to that committee on state enterprises. The committee will have met with them. After that meeting, the committee will report back, back to cabinet and the cabinet will take a decision. And just a final question from me. Do you have any fears, either one of you, of a repeat of the total day of policing or something similar, especially given uh, you're seeing the major uh, protective services uh, upset about, about money right now. Uh, do you have any fear of that? And what would you say to them at this time? I, I, I'll let the Minister of Labor res respond after. But from what I'm seeing, this is a dialogue. The trade unions have made uh, statements. The Minister of Finance has agreed to meet them on his return. It's a continuing dialogue. So I haven't seen a, a breakdown or any crisis that would um, lead me to that um, position. What I would like to add is that the 50% payment of what is due is really a very powerful signal of good faith that I'm quite sure the unions would take on board. And the dialogue would map out uh, the process to be used for the payment of the next 50% that is owed. And I, I can't see a situation like that leading to a breakdown where um, there may be action that uh, might result in discomfort for the nation. The $1 million compensation how soon is that likely to be imp implemented? Is it that um, you know legislation has to be prepared, or is it an administrative process that has to take um, place? My recollection being part of the meeting, there's a legal process. It may not be a lengthy legal process, but I want to make the point that uh, the former administration agreed to pay this $1 million and did absolutely nothing in terms of the necessary legal adjustments and no attempts were made to implement this decision that they took. This government recognizes that an undertaking has been given and with the assistance of the Minister of National Security, the necessary legal amendments would be made to implement that decision. And um, 
one assumes it's going to be retroactive, at least to the point at which it was announced by the last government, because there was, um, there, I, I think there was at least one previous um, no, I think I think it's more than one in terms of the meeting I attended. I think they indicated it's I think it's between three to five persons. It's not a large number, regrettably, but it's not a large number of uh, police officers who have been killed in the line of duty in such a manner. So it would be, it would take it oh yes, 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 yes. It's part of an order, a legal order, that I am not too familiar with. And therefore, I would like to invite members of the media to discuss further with the Minister of National Security, who would have much more information on the process to be followed in this regard. Does it only apply to policemen or all law enforcement officers? Well, my understanding is it is applicable to police officers. That was the initial announcement. And it's because of all the questions you're asking, you understand why now we need to establish a policy and put the mechanisms in place so that we can answer all those questions. And you understand, of course, law enforcement is law enforcement. And once you give the police something, everybody else is going to make a similar case. It will be equally valid, I think. What I would say to that is that we will have to deal with those issues as and when they, they arise. But with regards to this specific issue, the decision of the former administration was to pay to the police officers, and that is what we are keeping faith with. There was a suggestion uh, last, that last September there was uh, $10 billion, um, I think, in import of foreign exchange foreign exchange cover and that uh, five months into five months since it has been drawn down to some nine billion dollars is there and uh, there's been a call for an explanation of uh, what happened to the one billion is there any indication from you that um, you can explain that one billion I think the prime minister the finance minister dealt with that extensively in the statement last Friday in the parliament going back to the um, $1 million compensation. Um, it has been suggested that it could be affected by way of a simple cabinet note. Is no, there is an order that has to be amended. So it's, it's not only the cabinet's authority that is required here. If there are no further questions, thank you very much for your attendance here today and for your compelling question. Thank you.